Hey guys. Sorry, I'm running a little late today. I had uh, some trouble with the YouTube live stream software. Not sure why, but here we are again and back reading Crime and Punishment. His luck held. This archway proved straightforward too. In fact, at that very instant, as if on purpose, a massive hay cart entered the gates just in front of him, shielding him completely as he passed under the arch. And as soon as the cart emerged into the courtyard, he instantly slipped off to the right. Over there, on the other side of the cart, several voices could be heard shouting and arguing, but no one noticed him and no one crossed his path. Many of the windows that looked down on this enormous square courtyard were open at that moment, but he didn't lift his head. He hadn't the strength. The old woman's staircase was close by, directly off to the right after the arch. Here he was, already on the stairs. After catching his breath and pressing his hand to his thumping heart, after feeling for the axe and adjusting it one more time, he began climbing the stairs warily and softly, constantly straining his ears. But the staircase, too, was completely deserted at that moment. All the doors were shut. He met, precisely, no one. True, there was one empty apartment on the second floor with the doors flung open and decorators working inside, but they didn't so much as glance in his direction. He stood still for a moment, pondered, and walked on. Of course, it would be better if they weren't here at all, but there's another two floors to go. And here it was, the fourth floor, the door. The apartment opposite, the empty one, to all appearances, the third floor apartment right under the old woman's was also empty. The visiting card nailed to the door was gone. They'd moved. He was struggling to breathe. Perhaps I should leave suddenly occurred to him. But he left his own question unanswered and put his ear to the door of the old woman's apartment. Dead silence. Then he listened out again for noises below him, listening long and hard. He looked about one last time, straightened and tidied himself up, and tested the axe in the loop once more. Various thoughts crossed his mind. Hope I'm not too pale, not overexcited. She's mistrustful. Perhaps I should wait a bit for my heart to stop. But his heart did not stop. Quite the opposite. As if on purpose, it beat harder, harder, and harder. He couldn't resist. Slowly stretched his arm out towards the bell and rang. Half a minute later, he rang again, louder. No reply. It was pointless ringing for the sake of it, and unseemly. The old woman, needless to say, was in, but she was suspicious, and she was alone. He knew her habits, and once again he pressed his ear flush against the door. Whether it was the keenness of his senses, which is rather hard to imagine, or whether it really was very audible, but he suddenly heard what sounded like a hand cautiously feathering the lock and a dress rustling against the door itself. Someone was lurking right by the lock and just like him here on the outside was listening hard, crouching, and also it seemed pressing an ear to the door. He made a deliberate movement and muttered something rather too loudly to make it clear he wasn't hiding. Then he rang a third time, but softly, calmly, and without the slightest haste. Recalling this afterwards, vividly, clearly, that moment was imprinted on him for all time. He simply could not understand where he'd found such guile. Not least because there were moments when his mind seemed to go dark, and as for his body, he could barely feel it. Seconds later, someone could be heard lifting the latch. Chapter 7 the tiniest of chinks appeared in the doorway, just like the last time, and two sharp and mistrustful eyes stared out at him once again from the dark. Here Raskolnikov became flustered and nearly made a serious uh. mistake. Fearing that the old woman would take fright at finding herself alone with him and far from confident that his appearance would reassure her, he grabbed hold of the door and pulled it towards him just in case she should think of locking herself in again. 
Seeing this, she did not yank the door back towards her, but nor did she let go of the handle, and he very nearly ended up dragging her out onto the stairs together with the door. When he saw that she was blocking the doorway and not letting him pass, he walked straight at her. She leapt back in alarm and was on the point of saying something, but didn't seem able to, and stared at him wide-eyed. Hello, Aliona Ivanovna, he began as casually as he could, but his voice refused to obey him, broke off, and began to quiver. I've brought you the thing, but why don't we go over here towards the light? Leaving her there and without any invitation, he walked straight through into the main room. The old woman ran after him. She'd recovered her voice. Good Lord, what is it? Who are you? What do you want? Oh, for pity's sake, Alyona Ivanovna, we've met before, Raskolnikov. Here, I've brought the pledge I promised you the other day. And he proffered her the pledge. The old woman took one glance at the pledge before immediately fixing her eyes on those of her unbidden guest. She looked at him attentively with malice and mistrust. A minute or so passed. He even thought he detected a hint of mockery in her eyes, as though she'd already worked everything out. He sensed that, she, he, sensed that he was becoming flustered, that he was almost terrified, so terrified that another half minute of her wordless stare would have been enough to send him running. But why are you staring like this as if you don't recognize me, he suddenly said, also with malice. If you want it, take it. If not, I'll take it elsewhere. I have no time for this. He hadn't meant to say this. The words just came out. The old woman collected herself, evidently taking heart from her visitor's decisive tone. Why all the hurry, sir? What is it? She asked, looking at the pledge. A silver cigarette case. I told you last time. She stretched out her hand. Why are you so very pale? And look at those trembling hands. You've not been for a dip, have you, father? Fever, he replied curtly. Hard not to grow pale when you've nothing to eat, he added, barely getting the words out. His strength was deserting him once more. But the reply seemed credible. The old woman took the pledge. What is it, she asked, fixing her gaze on Raskolnikov once again and weighing the pledge in her hand. An item. Cigarette case, silver, take a look. Funny kind of silver, just look how he's wrapped it up. Trying to untie the string and turning towards the window to the light, she kept all her windows shut despite the closeness. She left him to himself for a few seconds and stood with her back to him. He unbuttoned his coat and freed the ax from the loop, but he didn't take it out fully yet, merely supporting it with his right hand beneath his clothing. His arms were terribly weak. He could feel them grow number and stiffer with each passing second. He was afraid he'd let the axe slip and fall, and suddenly he felt his head begin to spin. What has he done with the thing? The old woman cried in vexation, taking half a step towards him. There wasn't a moment to lose. He took the axe out fully, lifted it up high with both hands, barely feeling a thing, and almost effortlessly, almost mechanically, brought the butt down on her head, as if he were not even using his strength. But just as soon as he brought the axe down once, his strength was born. The old woman, as always, was bareheaded. Her light graying, thin hair, thickly greased as usual, was plaited in a pigtail and tucked up with a fragment of tortoise shell comb, which stuck out from the back of her head. The blow landed smack on the crown. She was very short after all. She cried out, though very feebly, and suddenly sank to the floor, managing only to raise both hands to her head. In one hand, she was still holding the pledge. Then he struck again with all his strength, and again, always with the butt and always on the crown. The blood poured out as from a toppled glass, and the body fell back. He stepped back to let it fall and immediately bent over her face. She was already dead. The eyes goggled, as if wanting to leap out, while the forehead and entire face were furrowed and twisted by spasms. He laid the axe on the floor next to the dead woman, and trying not to stain himself with the flowing blood, set about rummaging in her pocket, the same right pocket she'd taken her keys from the previous time. He had his wits about him, his mind did not go dark again, nor did his head spin. 
but his hands still shook. He later recalled how very meticulous and cautious he'd been trying not to get himself dirty. He pulled the keys out right away, just like before they were all in one bunch on a single steel ring. He immediately ran off with them to the bedroom. This was a very small room with an enormous icon cabinet. By another wall stood a large bed, immaculately clean with a silk patchwork quilt. Next to the third wall was the chest of drawers. How strange. No sooner did he try to fit the keys to the chest of drawers, and no sooner did he hear them jangle. Then he felt a kind of spasm go through him. Once again, he had a sudden urge to drop everything and leave, but this passed in a flash. It was too late for that. He even grinned at himself before he was suddenly struck by another disturbing thought. He had a sudden fancy that the old woman might still be alive and might still come around. Abandoning the keys and the chest of drawers, he ran back to the body, grabbed the ax, and brandished it once more over the old woman, but without bringing it down. There was no doubting that she was dead. Leaning over again and examining her at close quarters, he saw clearly that the skull had been crushed and was even slightly lopsided. He was about to feel it with his finger, but drew back his hand. There was really no need. Meanwhile, a whole puddle of blood had now formed. Suddenly, he noticed a string around her neck and gave it a tug, but it was strong and refused to break. Besides, it was soaked in blood. He had a go at pulling the string straight from her bosom, but something got in the way. Losing patience, he was on the point of raising the axe again so as to chop through the string and the body from above and have done with it. But he didn't dare. And after struggling for two minutes and getting the axe in his hands all stained, he finally cut the string without the axe touching the body and removed it. He was right a purse. There were two crosses on the string, one of cypress and one of copper, and a little enamel icon as well, and right there alongside them hung a small greasy suede purse with a steel rim and clasp. The purse was stuffed full. Raskolnikov shoved it in his pocket without looking inside, dropped the crosses on the old woman's breast, and taking the axe with him this time, rushed back into the bedroom. In a terrible hurry, he grabbed the keys and began fiddling with them again, but he was getting nowhere. They just wouldn't go in. It wasn't so much that his hands were shaking, he just couldn't get it right. He could see, for instance, that he had the wrong key and that it didn't fit, but still he kept jabbing away with it. Suddenly he remembered and realized that the big key with the jagged notches dangling there with the smaller ones couldn't have been meant for the chest of drawers at all. This had occurred to him the previous time, too. But for some box or other, which was where everything might very well be hidden, he abandoned the chest of drawers and immediately crawled under the bed, knowing that that is where old women tend to keep their boxes. And there it was, a sizable box about three feet long, with a curved lid of red Morocco leather studded with small steel nails. The jagged key went straight in and opened it. On top, beneath a white sheet, lay a red silk coat lined with rabbit fur. Beneath that was a silk dress, then a shawl, while deeper in there seemed to be nothing but old rags. His first impulse was to wipe his blood-stained hands on the red silk, but he barely touched the rags when a gold watch suddenly fell out of the fur coat. He hastily ransacked the rest. Yes, there were gold things mixed up with the rags, probably all pledges, bracelets, chains, earrings, pins, and so forth. Some were in cases, others just wrapped in newspaper, but neatly and carefully, the paper folded double and tied round with tape. Without a moment's delay, he set about stuffing the pockets of his trousers and coat without sorting through or even opening the packages and boxes, but he soon ran out of time. He suddenly heard someone moving about in the room where he'd left the old woman. He froze and fell silent as if dead, but everything was quiet. He must have imagined it. Suddenly, unmistakably, there was a faint cry or perhaps the sound of a soft, abrupt groan then dead silence again, for a minute or perhaps two. He was squatting by the box, waiting, barely breathing. Then he suddenly jumped up, grabbed the axe, and ran out of the bedroom. There in the middle of the room stood Lizaveta, holding a large bundle and gazing rigidly at her murdered sister, white as a sheet and seemingly unable to scream. Seeing him run in, she began quivering all over, and her whole face went into spasm. 
She half raised a hand and was about to open her mouth, but again she did not scream and slowly backed away from him into the corner, staring straight at him, but still without screaming as if there was not enough air to scream. He rushed at her with the axe, her lips twisted as pitifully as those of very little children when something begins to scare them and they stare at the thing that's frightening them and prepare to yell at her face, even though there could have been no more instinctive or essential gesture at that moment. For the axe was raised directly over her face. She just lifted her free left arm an inch or two, nowhere near her face, and slowly held it out towards him as if pushing him away. The blow landed right on the skull, blade first, and smashed through the upper part of the forehead, almost as far as the crown. She collapsed there and then. In complete confusion, Raskolnikov grabbed her bundle, dropped it again, and ran out into the hall. Fear was gripping him tighter and tighter, especially after the second wholly unexpected killing. He wanted to flee. The sooner, the better. And had he only been capable at that moment of seeing straight and thinking straight, had he only been able to grasp all the difficulties of his plight, all its hopelessness, hideousness, and absurdity, and to understand how many obstacles and perhaps even acts of evil he still had to overcome and commit to get out and get home, then he might very well have dropped everything and immediately gone and given himself up. Not out of fear for himself, but from pure horror and disgust at what he had done. This disgust in particular was rising and growing inside him minute by minute. Not for anything in the world would he have gone back to the box now or even into the rooms. But little by little, he felt himself become distracted, almost pensive. For minutes at a time, he seemed to forget what he was doing. Or rather, he would forget about the main thing and cling to trifles, still glancing into the kitchen and spotting a bucket half filled with water on a bench. He had the presence of mind to wash his hands and the axe. His hands were bloody and sticky. He lowered the axe straight into the water blade first, grabbed a sliver of soap from a cracked saucer on the windowsill, and set about washing his hands right there in the bucket. After washing them clean, he took the axe out as well, cleaned the metal, and spent a good three minutes cleaning the wood where it was stained, even trying the soap on the blood. Then he wiped everything with the laundry, drying right there on a clothesline stretched across the kitchen, before making a lengthy and meticulous inspection of the axe by the window. No traces remained, though the wood was still damp. He carefully secured the axe in the loop under his coat. Then, as best he could, in the dim light of the kitchen, he inspected his coat, trousers, and boots. They seemed fine at first glance. Only the boots were stained. He moistened a rag and wiped them but he knew he couldn't see well and might have missed something obvious. He stood thinking in the middle of the room, an excruciating dark thought was welling up inside him. The thought that he was out of his mind. That at this moment he was capable neither of reasoning nor of defending himself. That perhaps he was going about things in entirely the wrong way. God, I must run. Run, he muttered, rushing out into the hall. But there, a horror awaited him, the like of which, needless to say, he had never known. He stood, stared, and could not believe his eyes. The door, the outer door, leading from the hall to the stairs, the same one through which he had entered after ringing just a short while before, stood ajar by as much as a hand's breadth, neither locked nor on the latch, all this time, all of it. The old woman hadn't closed the door behind him, perhaps as a precaution. God almighty, he'd, see, he'd since seen Lizaveta after all. How on earth had he failed to realize that she must have got in somehow? She couldn't have walked in through the wall. He rushed to the door and fastened the latch. But no, that's wrong too. I must go, go. He lifted the latch, opened the door on the stairs and began listening. He listened long and hard. Somewhere far away down below, probably at the gates, two voices were shouting loud and shrill, arguing and swearing. What are they up to? He waited patiently. Then eventually, just like that, silence. They'd gone their separate ways. He was about to leave when suddenly a door opened with a great racket. 
onto the stairs on the floor below and someone started going down, humming a tune. How noisy they are, flashed through his mind. He shut the door again and waited. Finally, everything went quiet, not a soul. He was just about to step onto the stairs when once again he suddenly heard footsteps, different ones. These footsteps came from far away, right from the bottom of the stairwell. But he remembered very vividly and distinctly that somehow from the very first sound, he suspected that their destination was here and nowhere else. The fourth floor, the old woman. Why? Were the sounds so very special, so very meaningful? The footsteps were heavy even, unhurried. There, he had already reached the first floor and was carrying on up, louder and louder. Now came the sound of heavy breathing, climbing up to the third, coming here. He felt his whole body suddenly go rigid as if this were a dream, the kind of dream where someone is chasing you, breathing down your neck, about to kill you, while you yourself seem rooted to the spot and can't even move your hands. Only when the visitor was already on his way up to the fourth floor did he suddenly rouse himself and somehow manage to slip quickly and nimbly back into the apartment and close the door behind him. Then he grabbed the latch and quietly, soundlessly placed the hook in its eye. Instinct was coming to his aid. Then he crouched right there by the door, holding his breath. The unbidden guest was also already at the door. They were standing opposite one another now, just like before with the old woman when they were separated by the door and he was the one listening in. The visitor drew several heaving breaths. Must be big and fat, thought Raskolnikov, his hand gripping the ax. Yes, all this really was like a dream. The visitor grabbed the bell and gave it a good ring. No sooner did he hear the bell's tinny sound than he had a sudden fancy that someone had stirred in the room. For a few seconds, he even cocked an ear in earnest. The stranger rang once again, waited a bit more, then suddenly lost patience and began tugging on the door handle with all his strength. Horrified, Raskolnikov watched with dull terror as the hook of the latch twitched in the eye and half expected it to snap out at any moment. The way the handle was being tugged, it seemed more than likely. He thought of holding the latch in place, but then he might realize. Once again, he felt his head begin to spin. I'll fall any moment. But no sooner had he thought this than the stranger began speaking, and he immediately came to his senses. What are they doing in there, dozing? Or has someone done them in, damned women? He roared, as if from a barrel. Oi, Alyona Ivanovna, my old witch. Lizaveta Ivanovna, my beauty. Open up. Fast asleep, are they? Working himself up into a frenzy, he tugged the little bell another ten times or so as hard as he could. Evidently, he was used to getting his way around here. At that very moment, the sound of short, hurried steps suddenly carried up from close by on the stairs. Someone else was coming, too. Raskolnikov hadn't even heard it first. Is there really no one in? shouted the new man, loudly and cheerfully addressing the first visitor, who was still tugging the bell. Hello there, Coke! Very young, going by his voice, Raskolnikov suddenly thought. Hell knows, but I almost broke the lock, replied Koch. And how do you know me, may I ask? You having me on just the other day, playing billiards in Gambrinus. I took three games off of you in a row. Ah, so they're out? How strange, and how stupid. Where on earth could the old woman have got to? I have business with her, and I have business too, my friend. Well, what's to be done? Back down, I suppose. And there I was expecting some cash, cried the young man. Down we go then, but why fix a time? She's the one who told me to come at this time. Plus it was out of my way, and where the devil is she wandered off to? That's what I don't understand. The old witch spends the whole year stewing at home, nursing her gammy legs. And now look, out and about all of a sudden? How about asking the caretaker? Asking him what? Where she went and when she's back. Hmm. Well, what's the use? I mean, she never goes anywhere. He gave the door handle another tug. There's nothing for it. I'm off. Wait, the young man suddenly cried. Look, see the gap when you pull the door? Well, 
So it's not locked, it's latched. On the hook, I mean. Hear how it rattles? Well. But don't you see? It means one of them must be in. If they were both out, they'd have locked it with a key from the outside, not latched it from inside like now. Hear it rattling? To latch it from the inside, you have to be in, don't you see? So they must be in, they're just not opening. Ha ha, you're right, Coke exclaimed in astonishment. So what can they be doing in there? And he began furiously tugging the handle. Wait, cried the young man once again. Stop pulling. There's something amiss here. After all, you've been ringing, tugging, and they're not opening. So either they've both fainted or... What? Here's what. We'll fetch the caretaker. Let him wake them up. Agreed. They set off down together. Wait, no, you stay put. I'll run and get the caretaker. Why should I stay? Well, you never know. I suppose. I'm training to be an example. Coke remained where he was and gently fiddled a bit more with the bell, which tinkled once. Then in a kind of studious, thoughtful way, he began fiddling softly with the door handle, pulling it and letting it go, so as to make doubly certain that the door was only on the hook. Puffing and panting, he bent down and began looking through the keyhole. But the key was in the lock on the other side, so there was nothing to see. Raskolnikov stood, gripping the axe at all, and shout something out to them from behind the door. At times, he suddenly felt like arguing with them, teasing them, until they finally got it open. The sooner the better flashed through his mind. Where's he got to, damn it? Time passed, whole minutes passed. No one came. Coke became restless. Damn it all, he suddenly yelled, quitting his post in a fit of impatience and setting off down the stairs in a hurry, boots clattering. Silence. God, now what? As Kolnikov lifted the latch, opened the door a little, he couldn't hear a thing, and suddenly, without a thought in his head, stepped out, shut the door behind him as firmly as he could, and set off down the stairs. He was already three flights down when he suddenly heard a loud noise blow. Now what? There was simply nowhere to hide. He was even about to run back into, into the apartment. Oi, wait there, you devil, wait there! With a cry, someone came tearing out of one of the apartments, not so much running as plummeting down the stairs and yelling at the top of his voice, Mitka, 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 I'll have you, you devil. The cry ended in a squeal. A few last noises came in from outside and everything went quiet. But at that very instant, several men speaking loud and fast began tramping up the stairs. There were three or four of them. He recognized the young lad's booming voice. It's them. In total despair, he made straight for them. What will be will be. I'm ruined if they stop me. Ruined if they let me pass. They'll remember. They were about to meet just one flight of stairs between them when suddenly, salvation. A few steps away from him to the right, an empty apartment. An, an apartment stood empty and open. That same second floor apartment which the workmen had been painting and which, as if on purpose, they'd now vacated. So that was them running out just now with such a hue and cry. The floors had just been painted. In the middle of the room stood a vat and a pot with a paint and a brush. He darted through the open door in a flash and hid on the other side of the wall in the very nick of time. They were already on the landing. Then they turned to carry on up to the fourth floor, talking loudly. He waited for them to go past, walked out on tiptoe, and ran off down. No one on the stairs or at the gates. He passed quickly under the arch and turned left down the street. He knew full well that they were already in the apartment right now, that they were astonished to find it open when it had just been closed, that they were already looking at the bodies, and that it would take no more than a minute for them to work out beyond any shadow of a doubt that the murderer had been there just moments before and had managed to hide somewhere, slip past them, run off. And they might also work that he'd been waiting in the empty apartment as they, perhaps I should duck under one of these arches and wait it out in some stairwell. No, no good. Or chuck away the axe somewhere. Or hail a cab. No good. No good. At last, the lane. He turned into it more dead than alive. He was already halfway to safety and he understood this. There'd be less reason for suspicion, not to mention a bus, but all these agonies had left him so feeble he could barely move. Sweat was dripping off him. His neck was all wet. Drunk as a lord, someone yelled out to him when he came out by the ditch.
he was in a state of near oblivion and it was only getting worse. But he did remember how frightened he was when he came out by the ditch and saw how few people there were and how conspicuous he was, and he almost turned back into the lane. But even though he could barely stay on his feet, he still made a detour and returned home from a completely different direction. He still hadn't recovered his wits when he passed through the gates to his building. At any rate, he was already on the stairs by the time he remembered the ax. Yet the task facing him was of, of the utmost importance, to put it back, and as discreetly as possible. Of course, he was in no fit state by now to realize that he might have been far better off not returning the axe to his former place at all, but sneaking it into some other courtyard, later if need be, and leaving it there. But everything turned out well. The door of the lodge was shut but not locked, so the caretaker was probably in, Incapable by now of thinking straight about anything, he walked right up to the lodge and opened the door. Had the caretaker asked him, what do you want? He might very well have simply handed over the axe. But the caretaker was out again, and he managed to put the axe back in its former place beneath the bench. He even covered it with a log as before. He met no one, not a single soul, all the way back to his room. The landlady's door was shut Entering his room, he threw himself on the couch just as he was. He wasn't asleep. He was in a trance. If someone had come into his room just then, he'd have leapt to his feet at once and screamed. His mind was a swarm with shreds and scraps of thought, but try as he might, he couldn't catch hold of any of them, nor focus on a single one. We have arrived at part two of the novel. Chapter one, he lay like that for a very long time. Occasionally, he even seemed to wake up and at such moments he noticed that night had long since fallen, but the thought of getting up did not occur to him. Eventually, he noticed it was already as bright as day. He lay supine on the couch, still dazed after his recent trance. The rasping sounds of terrible, desperate screams from the street reached his ears the same sounds, in fact, that he listened out for beneath his window every night between two and three. It was this that had woken him up. Ah, the drunks are pouring out of the dens, he thought. So it's gone too. And he suddenly jumped to his feet as though someone had yanked him off the couch. What? Gone too already? He sat down on the couch and everything came back to him suddenly, all at once. For a second or two, he'd thought he'd go mad. He felt freezing cold but the cold came from the fever as well, which had set in while he was sleeping some time before. Now he was suddenly struck by a fit of shivering so violent that his teeth almost leapt from his mouth and his insides were thrown this way and that. He opened the door and listened. The whole house was fast asleep. He looked at himself and everything else in the room in complete astonishment. How on earth could he have just walked in yesterday, left the door off the latch and flung himself on the couch without even taking off his hat Never mind his clothes. The hat had slid down to the floor, not far from the pillow. If someone had walked in, what would they have thought? That I was drunk, but he rushed over to the little window. There was enough light, and he hastily set about ins inspecting himself all over from top to toe, every item of clothing. Any traces? But that was no way to do it. Shaking uncontrollably, he started taking everything off and inspecting it all over again. He turned everything inside out down to the last thread and scrap of cloth, and, not trusting himself, repeated the inspection another two or three times. But there didn't seem to be anything, not a single trace. Only where his trousers were frayed at the ends did thick traces of caked blood still remain. He grabbed his big folding knife and cut off the frayed ends. That seemed to be it. Suddenly he remembered that the purse and the items from the old woman's box were still in his pockets. It hadn't even crossed his mind to take them out and hide them. He hadn't even remembered them now while inspecting him, his clothes. Why on earth not? Quick as a flash, he began taking them out and flinging them down on the table. After emptying his pockets and even turning them inside out to check he hadn't missed anything, he carried the whole pile over to the corner. There, right in the corner near the floor, the peeling wallpaper was torn in one place. He immediately started stuffing everything into this hole behind the paper 
done it, out of sight, out of mind. And the purse, too, he thought with a sense of joy, half rising and looking dully at the corner, at the hole, bulging even more than before. Suddenly his whole body shuddered with horror. God, he whispered in despair, what's the matter with me? Call that hidden? Call that hiding? True, he hadn't reckoned on the items. He'd only expected to find money, which was why he hadn't prepared anywhere in advance. But now what have I got to be so happy about, he thought. Call that hiding? My wits really are deserting me. He sat down on the couch in complete exhaustion and was immediately shaken by another unbearable fit of shivering. He reached without thinking for the winter coat lying next to him on the chair, his old student one, warm, but now almost in shreds, covered himself with it, and sleep and delirium seized him once more. Oblivion came over him. Less than five minutes later, he was back on his feet and set about his clothes once more in a kind of frenzy. How could I fall asleep again when nothing's been done? See, see, I haven't even taken the loop off the armpit to forget a thing like that, a clue like that. He ripped out the loop and set about hurriedly tearing it to pieces, then stuffing it under the pillow in amongst the linen. Torn bits of old cloth can't arouse anyone's suspicion. Surely they can't. Surely they can't, he repeated, standing in the middle of the room. In an agony of concentration, he began looking around again on the floor and all around. Anything else he might have forgotten? The conviction that everything was deserting him, even his memory, even the ability to put two and two together, was becoming an unbearable torment. What? Is this it already? My punishment? Yes, that's it. That's it! The frayed ends he'd cut off from his trousers really did lie strewn across the floor in the middle of the room for anyone to see. What on earth's the matter with me? He cried out once more as if lost. Here a strange thought occurred to him. What if there was blood all over his clothes? What if there were lots of stains only he couldn't see them, didn't notice them, because his ability to think had been shot to pieces? His mind had gone dark. Suddenly he remembered. There was blood on the purse as well. Ah, so there must be blood in the pocket, too. The purse was still wet when I put it there. In a flash, he turned out the pocket. And there they were, traces and stains on the lining. So my wits haven't deserted me completely yet, nor my memory, and I can still put two and two together. If I caught myself in time, he exulted, breathing a deep and joyful sigh. This is just weakness brought on by fever, a moment's delirium, and he ripped out the entire lining from his left trouser pocket. At that moment, a ray of sunlight fell on his left boot. The sock poking out of it seemed to have some kind of marks on it. He kicked off the boot. Yes, marks. Look, the toes all soaked in blood. He must have stepped in that puddle of blood by mistake. Now what? What do I do with this sock, the trouser ends, the pocket? He gathered it all up in one hand and stood in the middle of the room. Bung it all in the stove? But that's the first place they'll look. Burn it? With what? I haven't even got matches. No, I'm better off going out and getting rid of the whole lot somewhere. Yes, get rid of it, he repeated, sitting down on the couch again. And do it now this very minute without delay. But no, once again, his head sank back onto the pillow. Once again... An unbearable fit of shivering turned him to ice. Once again, he reached for his greatcoat. And for a long time, for several hours, the words kept coming back to him in waves. Just go somewhere. Right now. Don't put it off. Get rid of it all. Out of sight. The sooner the better. Several times he made as if to get up from the couch. But he was no longer able to. Not until there was a loud knock on the door did he wake up fully. Open up if you're still alive. Won't he ever stop snoozing? Shouted Nastasia, banging on the door with her fist. Snoozes all day long like a dog. A, he sat up with a jerk. His heart was thumping so hard it even hurt. Who put the door on the hook then? Nastasia objected. So he's locking himself in now, eh? Scared of being stolen, I suppose. Open up, egghead. Wakey, wakey. What do they want? Why's the caretaker come? The story's out. Resist or open? Ah, to hell with it. He leant forward and lifted the hook. The dimensions of his room were such that he could lift the hook without getting up from his bed. Just as he thought, the caretaker and Nastasia 
There was something strange about the way Nastasia looked him up and down. He threw a defiant and desperate glance at the caretaker. The latter silently handed over a gray piece of paper folded in two and sealed with bottle wax. A summons from the bureau, he said, giving him the piece of paper. What bureau? The police want to see you, that's what, in the bureau. You know which bureau. The police, what for? Nastasia remarked, never taking her eyes off him. The caretaker also glanced back before leaving. Running a fever since yesterday, she added. He made no reply and held the piece of paper still sealed in his hands. You'd best stay in bed, Nastasia went on, taking pity as she watched him lower his feet to the floor. Stay put if you're sick. That can wait. What's that in your hand? He looked down. His right hand held the snicked off trouser ends, the sock, and the shreds of the ripped out pocket. He'd slept with them like that. Later on, turning all this over in his mind, he recalled how half waking with fever, he'd clench it all fiercely in his hand and fall asleep again. A regular scrap collector, he even sleeps with them like hidden treasure. And Nastasha went into fits of her unhealthy, nervous laughter. Quick as a flash, he stuffed everything under his greatcoat and fastened his eyes on her. Though he could barely think straight, he sensed that this was not how a man being taken away would be treated. But the police? Please yourself. She followed the caretaker out. He rushed over to the window to inspect the sock and trouser ends. There are stains, but not very noticeable ones. It's all mixed up with dirt, all rubbed and faded. You'd never spot anything unless you knew. So Nastasia, thank God, couldn't have seen anything from where she was. Then, in trepidation, he unsealed the summons and began reading. He read for a long time before he could understand what he was reading. It was an ordinary summons from the local police bureau to present himself that very same day at half past nine to the district superintendent. It's unheard of. What business have I ever had with the police and why today of all days? He thought, racked with confusion. Lord, the sooner the better. He was about to fall to his knees in prayer only to burst out laughing at himself, not the prayer. He began hurriedly getting dressed. If I'm done for, I'm done for. So be it. The sack, put it on, suddenly occurred to him. It'll get even dustier and dirtier and the traces will vanish. But no sooner had he put it on than he immediately pulled it off in disgust and horror. He pulled it off and then realizing it was the only one he had, put it back on again and again burst out laughing. This is all mere convention, merely relative, mere form, came a passing thought, glimpsed at the very edge of his mind while his whole body shook. Look, I still put it on. In the end, I still put it on. But laughter instantly gave way to despair. No, I'm, it's a trick. They want to lure me in, then trip me up, he went on to himself, walking out onto the landing. Too bad I'm almost raving. I might come out with something stupid. And we're going to end it here and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening.